Hello, everyone. Coming to you from the heart of Chamonix, this is Billy Yang, joined, of course, by my partner in crime, Mario Fraley, over there for a very special episode of the Weekly Rundown. First filmed episode. First filmed episode on what is typically a Patreon exclusive show, but I think we're going to do something a little bit different today. Um, If you aren't aware, this is a show where Mario and I geek out for about 30 to 45 minutes on all things endurance sports, what's going on in our lives, that kind of stuff. But today with UTMB drawing near, we're going to dedicate an entire episode to what I consider to be the World Cup of Mountain ultra running is that safe Super to say? Super Bowl for well, I was going to go Super like Bowl, but that's football. I don't want to be too nationalistic. Let me let me pot you up a little bit there, Mario. Um, We've got guests too. Yes, and joining us today, first time. Joining us today for the very first time, not only two fans of endurance sports, but two amazing runners in their own right. One of which will be participating on Friday at what we just recently dubbed the World Cup of endurance sports. Corinne Malcolm. To Mario's right, to my left, Dylan Bowman, Red Bull, North Face athlete, Adidas athlete over there. Want to get that out. Um, welcome, you guys. Welcome to the show. Thanks, guys. Yeah, <laughs> two of our favorite uh, running media personalities, and it's going to be fun to uh, BS for a little while here. Oh, we're stoked to have you. We're expecting hot takes from Dylan and Corinne. <laughs> Yes. I don't know what kind of takes Billy and I are going to give, but yeah, thanks, we'll try to sound intelligent. Thanks for intelligent. letting us nerd out. Well, I want to say we brought them on for a reason because... We pulled them off the UTMB broadcast. I mean, <laughs> they've been on the live broadcast giving the English commentary yeah. since this well, morning, I believe, if not before. This is true. This is true. Um, well, let's not waste too much time because there's a lot to unpack and uncover. Um, as you know, this is a very, very stacked field. I would say it may lean a little more deep on the women's side this year versus past years past where we had like 2017 for instance when dylan was a part of that field probably had one of the deepest fields on the men's side but um and just glancing over the list certain notable names on the men's side are missing like a killing journey francois dehane uh jim walmsley of course and um and so yeah let's just start talking what we'll do the format of this will be we will kind of go over who the favorites in the race are and maybe if we have some personal dark horses that may not be obvious to some of the people out there. So that will be the format. I thought um, I thought we'll just start. Should we go on the men or the women's side? Which, uh, which field should we start at? I'm going to defer to Corinne and let the lady choose who goes first. Um, why don't we start with the women's race? All right, let's do that. It's really deep this year. It's really exciting this year. I think there's 30 women who could be top 10 pretty easily, and we've got a long race to make that happen. So what are some of the names that jump to mind immediately? If you had to bet your entire Adidas wardrobe on, because I know it, it definitely... She just got two full duffel bags exactly, full that's of gear. Exactly, that's what I'm talking about. Lunch. Um, who, would be, who would be your def- like podium immediately like I think it's really hard to bet against Courtney DeWalter mm-hmm. um, I think Katie Scheid and I'm not I'm like not super biased North American standpoint but I think she's had an amazing season um, and she doesn't get a lot of media attention because she doesn't live in the states yeah she's she's almost an unknown to like the US audience despite the fact that she's been crushing it over in Europe um, and then, then third, honestly, I think someone like Beth Pascal, who had a really great Western States, um, and who's, who's already proven that she can run this course really well, I wouldn't be surprised to see her in the top three at all. What are some of their, what are some of Beth and, um, I'm sorry, what's the second name? Katie. Katie. What are their notable accomplishments in the... So Beth was just fourth at Western States. I think she was fourth at UTMB last year. Katie won the Mont Blanc 90K this summer. She was second to Courtney at Madeira, I believe. Yeah, yeah. And and closing hard on her is kind of my understanding. Um, but for Katie, this is her first 100-mile race. So there's a lot of unknown there. Um, Courtney, as we know, is coming back from injury that took her out of Western States. So... You know what's what's the what like what's the unknown there? Despite you know being a favorite, there's there's all these little variables with each of these runners where it's, you know, Beth out of that group of three I just said probably is the most stable going into this race. Debo, what about you? Okay, so I think as Corinne said, it's really hard to bet against Courtney, but I think this is easily the most vulnerable she's been in the last two or three seasons. Yep. Obviously, she's had one of the most meteoric 
rises in the sport over the last few years and has already kind of established herself as maybe one of the best of all time if you consider across all distances and certainly if she would have held it together we're giving her goat status i mean one one of you know she's close to the mount rushmore um i spoke to her yesterday and uh got a little bit of understanding about what she was dealing with with her hip and it seemed that it is now in the rearview mirror though she did say that her training wasn't ideal leading into the race and Obviously, UTMB is just the type of event to where if you're even a little bit off, you can just get exposed with the level of athletes that are in the field. I think for her, the most important thing is going to be to get past that 10 or 12 hour mark where her hip kind of failed her at Western States. And if she can get past that psychologically, I think, you know, she uh, is the most talented runner in the field. I agree. Katie Scheid is somebody who people should be talking about more uh, young and le- maybe the youngest and least experienced of the women in the field. Um, but I think sometimes that can be an advantage. Her first hundred miler, her boyfriend's running too. And we were talking yesterday about how that can be sort of like energizing for her too, because she's sort of getting reports about where he is. And then I think that the major, um, I guess, wild card in the race, somebody who's going to have a huge impact on the dynamic is Yao Miao from China who won CCC last year. She's only like 25, but she goes like full gas. And so I would expect her to be like mixing it up with the top 15 or 20 men through uh, Saint-Gervais or Le Contamine, in those early aid stations um, because she's just going to be going all out. So that will impact the entire field likely. Um, and I see her as sort of like, she'll probably either win or drop out. Uh, but as she proved at CCC last year, she's capable of winning on this stage. And um, yeah, I would expect her to have a huge impact on the field. Yeah, it's her first 100 mile as well. And so that leaves a big question mark. And I've also, my question is that she can run through 100K pretty easily, but can you get away with that in a race like UTMB? And is she comfortable using poles? And is she going to use poles? And what is her hiking like? And I think that will be what past Cormier um, allows us to see with her. And it'll be interesting too, to Dylan's point, um, most people are not rewarded for early aggressiveness here. Mm and in her case being her first hundred and having a proclivity for going out really hard i mean i think it goes one of two ways to your point she either gasses it the entire way and holds on for the win or she dnfs but she's going to be a factor Mm -hmm. either way and she's going to affect other people's races for better or worse i think the easiest prediction is that she'll be in the lead early and it's going to be uh then interesting to see does somebody like courtney try and stay close um and you know of course there's risks that come with that but i think that's a a, gonna be a fair prediction so in looking at some of the you know in in utmb the top 10 is recognized so we that is more or less the quote-unquote podium as far as utmb is concerned Uh, i think it's just a testament to how deep the field is because we haven't mentioned names like nuria might enter we haven't heard a definitive whether or not she's in the race or not but obviously knows the course very well strong runner um rory bozio another two-time champion um fernanda i mean there's the list goes on and on so it's a crazy who, list which is why we have these screens in front yeah, of us so we can keep yeah. tabs on it because it's impossible yeah, to uh, i mean i i think honestly i would love to see rory come back and i think she is targeting this race like she did back in 13 and 14. She spent a good amount of time yeah. here. I forget exactly yeah. how long, but she know, she's if anyone knows course. how to run it and spread themselves out over the course of 105 miles around Mont Blanc, it's Rory Bosio. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And Andrea Hooser too. She was second behind uh, Nuria when Nuria won in 17 and she was closing really quickly. I think the gap was only three minutes at the end of the race and she, I think, sort of had a year of injury last year. So I she's think she's still up. out. I think, oh, is she? I think Andrea is still out with a stress reaction. Okay. I think I recently saw her on crutches. Mm. Oh, so okay. So I, I think she's another. There's a lot of scratches because you this this list is set in December or right. January, and there's a ton of notable women who are on the list but will not be 
starting either for you know they've they've opted out of it Mm because they know that it's time to pull back or they're they're hurt or they've switched to a different distance this weekend are there any other notable names that come to mind um caitlin gerben who had a great western states decided not to run steph howe switched down to ccc um who else uh sarah kais broke her ankle this spring and is is running again but not running utmb distances kind of like me yeah She'll be out here supporting, but won't be racing. So there's there's a number of, of runners who we won't actually see on the start line this weekend, unfortunately. We haven't mentioned Casey Licktig's name. She was 10th here last year. She had a good Western States earlier this year. She's been healthy for a while now. This is not her forte, these big mountain races, but she ain't bad at them. And, I mean, she knows how to compete, and she knows how to put herself in it, and she's a very smart racer. wouldn't surprise me to see her end up in the top 10 again. I mean, I think it, you can't really overstate how impressive it is to train in nebraska right. and finish <laughs> right. in the top 10 at utmb and she she in my mind looking at her training over the past year has put together one of her best training blocks out of the last couple of years coming mm. back from injury um being able to train post western states like i think we're looking at a different casey than what we saw last year at this race and what she did last year at this race was still phenomenal mm. so it's hard it's hard to count her out as well what do we know about Mimi? That I was just going to move to that too. She is a beast. Yeah. yeah. And I think in the last few years, she's been one of the best, like pure mountain ultra trail runners in the world. You know, she, she won TDS, uh, I guess it was two years ago in an incredible Handily. dominant way. Yeah. She's done really well. Like, at the maxi race she had a tough go at madeira earlier in in april in fact i think she dropped out there um, yeah i told mario earlier the interesting thing about mimi is are we getting 2017 mimi are we getting 2018 mimi like where where is she in her training and her racing and i think she's it to me it feels like that's still to be figured out um i don't know that we're going to see 2017 mimi this weekend i would love to because she is ferocious and yeah. she is a great competitor. But this season has not yet shown me that that's what we're going to have this weekend from her. She dropped out early last year, didn't she? Oh, I think before or around Lazouche even. Yeah. I think it was only, it was very early in the race last year. And I suspect this year it'll be pretty similar. If it's not going well for her, she'll be out of it early. But if she's in it halfway through, watch out. She's in it to make a difference. Yeah. And it wouldn't surprise me to see her, you know, do something pretty special in the second half, if that's the case. Any other names like Francesca, uh, Fernanda? <coughs> Curran Malcolm. <laughs> well, I, I was going to I was gonna say that for the tail end, but Corinne Malcolm, how are we feeling? How am I feeling? How are we feeling? I mean, it's, it's crazy that you can mention, like, we haven't mentioned last year's winner of yeah. UTMB <laughs> until just now with Francesca. Like, Again, it's just a testament to how deep the field is. The field is crazy. And I, I and last year was a bit of an anomaly. And nothing was. nothing against uh, Anyone. Francesca. Yeah, I, but it was, it a was weird bonkers year. crazy. Oh, yeah. I, like no, no, no through line in all the DNFs, the, the rampant number of DNFs. Yep. And I, I can't make heads or tails of what happened last year. I just can't. Yeah, it, it was crazy. And honestly, that's been my take on the race this year is that we don't know what the weather's going to do. We don't know what the people are going to do. And like, I'm, I'm here to run my own race. And so like, I, I'm not a person that goes out too fast, I would say. And I've, I think I've shown that over and over again. So you I'm, are just steady as she goes, you know, yeah. like picking people off slowly. But I surely. like to go hunting. So I would imagine I, you will not see me in the first hundred K in any coverage. And I'm hoping that means that you will see me in the last, <laughs> the last 60 Cleaning or 70 K. Carnage. Yeah. That's, that's the goal is to go hunting, to, sw- to sweep up at the end of the race. Tell us about your days and weeks leading up to today or, you know, leading up to UTMB. Yeah. So I ran Western States earlier this year with the plan of that being like a, a training run in a way to UTMB, which is really weird. Western I know. States is a training run. <laughs> yeah. If anyone knows me, so hiking and ski racing is my background. So fast running is not my forte. And I've had to practice that over the last couple of years. And I'm way better at running on the flats than I've ever been, which I'm hoping will, will be translate good. Well. will translate well to this race too, just because there is a lot of running out there. Um, but I've been over here since early August and I went and previewed the whole course to, to actually see what, what it was like. Cause I ran TDS last year, um, same as Dylan and totally different course, totally different event. 
Um, but you I'm get excited. a lot more bang for buck, though. A lot more bang for your buck on the TDS course. Yeah. Um, I'm jealous of the racers out there today, actually. Um, <laughs> but it's going to be like you can't predict what's going to happen, even though we're trying right now for UTMB. And I'm excited to be part of the carnage this year or sweeping up the carnage this year. <laughs> Last year, I got to do commentary on the carnage, and I was just like so amped up on it that I knew that I had to put my name in the hat this year. And would you say you're more comfortable in this type of mountain environment given your background than a place like western state so being able to run your way into the top 10 there earlier this year must give you a lot of confidence heading into an event like this which is more suited for your background and your skill set. yeah like i think this is much more my natural environment for running like i i come from a ski background so using poles is like part of my body and so actually western states is kind of scary because i'm like i have to run the whole time (laughs) um so it's been really fun to be here and just to be putting in like big days in the mountains because that's my that's my comfort zone and so i'm I'm excited to get to go play for you know hopefully you know be done by bedtime on saturday but get to go play in the mountains for a long time well as such and take this in the spirit which is intended you were one of my dark horses yes are there any other dark horses that we haven't yet mentioned? Let's go back to the list here. <laughs> that you could see surprising people. Um, so two women who have proven that they can run at UTMB, but have we have not yet spoken about. They were both in TDS last year with me. Kelly Emerson and Alyssa St. Laurent um, were fifth and sixth in 2017, I want to say, in, in UTMB, the horrible weather year, because yeah. they are both tough, tough chicas. Um, they're both in UTMB this year, and... By all means, they seem fit, um, particularly Alyssa St. Laurent um, has been over in Colorado training in the mountains and seems to be really, I saw her this morning, she's happy and fit and ready to go. And I mean, especially if we get any form of weather, I would, they, I feel like they're kind of diesel engines, like they'll take a little while to get going, but they could clean up in the second half of the race for sure if they're in it. Have you been checking the forecast? Every day. Kind how, of how, How's Friday and Saturday looking? I, I mean, mild, honestly, right now. And that could change in the next 12, like 12 hours, 24 hours. It could change on Friday. We're looking for a, a, at a little bit of rain, but nothing like le- the last two years. Okay. So. It looks like really fast conditions. I mean, if it's anything like today, the TDS runners have really, really nice day. And if the if the weather kind of maintains this pattern, which it looks like it is, I think it's going to be a really fast, really fast race. And they should be able to run the real course. So. Yeah, good, good conditions. We're on, we're on, right now we're on the last climb of the course as well, which they were not on last year. That's right. Last year they were rerouted to the OCC course at the end. So they actually descend down to Argentière and then climb up to La Flagère instead of that last big climb. And then the, like the weird, like, transition across and so that honestly I, I think that alternate last climb is equally difficult yeah. and not faster than is so if they if they keep you going over tete uh, as the original course does and and you don't have to do the alternate finish um it's it's no faster to go lower i mean that trail is really hideous that the occ runners have to do and they've sent the utmb race through there the last two years and so i hope as somebody who's run that a few times that they can actually go over that it's a last great last climb, climb. it's mm-hmm. an amazing last climb and right now it looks like we're going to get to run it they had rock slides the week before last year which we have not had yet on course this year so i imagine we'll be running the the original and the normal route hmm. debo any dark horses i don't really have much more to add i mean i think yeah it's it's wild that you know, dark horses can be past champions like Rory, uh, Rory and Nuria, uh, I would expect them to both have really good races. And uh, yeah, I would agree. I mean, Kelly Emerson has had lots of, she's been um, top five, I think at UTMB. Yeah, uh, I wanna say she was fifth in 2017. Ago. Yeah, so uh, I think we've sort of ticked through uh, most of the, I think, um, most interesting names in the field. Yeah. Debo, as somebody who has experience at UTMB, like what, pardon the simple question, but like what are the specific type of skill sets, particularly to relate it back to maybe why American men in particular haven't necessarily done well or at least won the race? What do you think it is about UTMB that can be um, that double-edged sword, if you will? 
Well, first of all, I think the American men are getting closer. And this is our best shot ever to win the race. And we're learning how to train for it. So, for example, like Tim Tolfson lives in Mammoth. You know, you have to live and train in a place like that in order to have a shot against European athletes who live and train in places like Chamonix. Same with Zach Miller. You know, he lives at bar camp. So we're getting better at that. But I think the thing that makes this race so unique and so difficult are twofold. One, just the environment. Like you kind of have to see it to understand. And you uh, it could be overwhelming uh, for people who race mostly in North America to see what the scene is like here in Europe. The full Euro experience. It, it's the whole just, week, not even just during the race itself. And for me, it's so cool. You know, I love the sort of like low key American ultras, but like being here and seeing what the sport can be like on a professional level is so freaking cool. And when it's your first time here, or if you get sort of caught up in the environment, um, you can do too much in the week before the race. You know, you have these beautiful mountains, you have a million media and sponsor obligations. And, you know, it just takes time to learn like how to be a professional and, you know, bide your time appropriately. And the second thing is the course is just a monster. Like, and the way it sets up is that the last 50 K is the hardest part of the race. And that's why we see, so much attrition in the professional ranks, particularly the professional men, like around Champé Lac, because you're so competitive. You know the field is so strong, and you're you've been pushing for 70, 75 miles at that point, and then you go into the hardest part of the race, and so it just is like a combination of um, you know the biggest stage in the world and an incredibly difficult uh, course that gets more difficult at the end of the race that I think is what's led to American men in particular sort of having a hard time putting it together. But again, I think we're going to do it this year. So it's a different type of racing over here. It's much more aggressive than we're used to in the States. And I think it took American men in particular. I mean, Rory figured it out years ago and it's different environment. Chrissy and And Chrissy. Yeah, exactly. Like they, they nailed that part of it earlier on, but American men had to adjust to that style of, of racing and that it's going to be aggressive from the get go. And as you just described, the end of the course is just so dang hard. So mm-hmm. to be able to put yourself in it early on and still have enough left that you can compete over the last 50 K, uh, is, is not an easy task. But I want to go back to what Dylan said, because those are all great points. And a couple of them I hadn't considered in particular, the, uh, the outside stimuli that they might not be used to. I mean, look at Zach Miller last year, I think, what I saw, especially following him from the front row, is that he was very much influenced by outside stimuli, by the people who were cheering him on, and got swept up in that a little too much, and ran the governor a little too close to, to the red until yeah. he burnt out at Champé Lac. And it's just something that we don't get back, back at home, especially for somebody who is, you know, maybe, I don't want to generalize too much, but men might be more impacted by outside stimuli because of ego or pride or what have you totally yeah just putting it out there and um, i'm glad you said that (laughs) um but it's true it's true and so yeah i think there's a it's definitely formulaic and the the alchemy of a successful what it takes to run a, a successful utmb it's not just one thing but like you mentioned there's also uh adjusting to just European uh, time and the and the the overall swing and vibe, and also the sponsor obligations. There's a lot going on, you guys. Like as we speak right now, there's probably other events, signings, um, you know, like FaceTime in front of uh, other media well, and outlets. Well, this is Wednesday as we're recording, which is probably the yeah. busiest day of the week for most of the athletes. I know just from hanging with Tim this morning, he's got a Hoka booth signing, a Coros booth signing, and then a jewel bow signing yeah and uh, to the back to back to back and to the people who were here earlier to um to spend time on the course it can feel like cramming like oh i need to get intel on this course so you're putting in you're putting in mileage but what you don't also realize is that there's just there's no escaping the vert Mm -hmm. and so you're putting a ton of yeah you have uh, to come in really early i think to make that training block make sense right because we've seen people come in not so early and leave their race 
at Champagne Lot two weeks. I mean, before that, the that's race. pretty much what the American men did for, you know, the first ten years that this race took place. Is they'd come over here and they'd be like, "Wow, I should go Let's do go some explore. training. Right. I should go see the course." And then they've got all their sponsor stuff, and by the time the race comes, they're just like kind right. of flat. So let's dive into the men's side. Um, absent from the notables, of course, sitting to my left, Dylan Bowman. Um, I mean, A, as a... Last minute re-entry into the race, <laughs> Dylan Bowman. No, my longest run in like months this yeah. morning. So, yeah. You're ready. Maybe well, can we, can we break anything here? Yeah. Like, are you going to be a last minute entrant? No. Okay, no, okay, good. Okay, yeah. so let's get yeah. that out of the way. Yeah. So you're going to be... Uh, I wish, I wish. You're going to be following that. along as a fan. Hell yeah. yeah. And um, so... Who immediately jumped to mind? Let's just go more traditional podium. Like, you have to risk whatever, you know? Like, yeah, who's your money on to round out the top three? And who's who do you think your money's on to win it? Okay, so again, I think this is the year that an American man will win. That said, I think there's four people who can win the race mm-hmm. this year. That's Tim Tollison, Hayden Hawks, of course, Xavier Thevenard and Pau Capel. Mm. Um, Xavier, I think, is nearly as close to being unbeatable here as you can get, you know, in that echelon with Killian and Francois. Yeah. He's won UTMB three times, which is astounding in itself. He's won CCC. He's won TDS. He's won OCC. And his worst performance here in the Chamonix Valley is a fourth place finish in the 2017 UTMB, which was probably the most competitive race in Agreed. the history of the sport. He's also won the 90K of Mont Blanc twice. So being in the Chamonix Valley for Xavier must be like, you know, the it's most home course. Yeah, just victory after victory, you know, and he clearly knows how to run the race. And when your worst performance is like a low 20 hour fourth place finish, it's really hard to look past him, especially because he's the defending champion. Uh, that said, you know, I don't think he is without vulnerability, particularly with the other really impressive men in the field. Like I said, Pau Capel, Spanish runner, who's been one of the best long course racers in the world for the last two or three seasons. Mm -hmm. He was sixth in 2017. Uh, so he has done UTMB in the past. Um, and yeah, just really, really consistent runner. He was third at CCC last year and he just basically never has an awful day. And then our American heroes, I think Mm -hmm. Hayden and Tim are, um, both set up to have potential victorious performances. And I know we're all rooting for them, but obviously Tim um, has had an incredible season or basically since UTMB last year, he's kind of been on fire winning the USA 50 K champs. Yep. He was third at Madeira, which I know he, he didn't, he wasn't super proud about that performance, but still third in a world-class field or a world-class race. And then one Labrador, one of the best races in the world. Uh, so Tim is set up really well. And then I think Hayden honestly might be the most pure talented runner in the race. Uh, of course, this is a different ball game. Um, but he won CCC in you know, what was a course record performance though, the course changes all the time. So it's hard to really compare apples to apples, but I mean, he's, I think when he's on, he's incredibly hard to knock off and, you know, his, he's shown vulnerability in long races, both at TDS last year where he dropped out and at Trans Grand Canaria this year where he dropped out. But he won Labrador last year, so he's gone 120K and 12 plus hours and won a race, even though he suffered there. So his only vulnerability, I think, is just the the duration of the event. You know, if it was 120K, 100K, I think he'd probably be the favorite. But um, those are the four people I think who who can win. If I had to pick, I would pick Tim Tolson for the win. You're not going to get much pushback from Mario. <laughs> it's hard for me to be biased given that I've coached him since the end of 2014. But um, I can't disagree with anything Dylan just said. I think those are your four main guys right there. Yeah. Um, Xavier is... I mean, not even arguably, he is the favorite. I mean, he's won here, I mean, as Dylan said multiple times, he's defending champion. Uh, He's a hard guy to bet against. That said, last time he didn't win here, a guy named Tim Tollison finished one place in 
ahead of him in 2017. So, um, I mean, I think, and also to Dylan's point, like Hayden is going to be, if he knocks it out of the park and runs 19, 20 hours, that's seven, eight hours longer than he's ever raced. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's just, you know, and he could certainly do that. Wouldn't surprise me at all, but he's totally entering unknown territory with that. Um, but I think those are your, those are your four guys. The winner's going to come from that group. I am not going to pick a winner, uh, as not to jinx anything or show too much bias, but, uh, yeah, those are your, those are your guys. Uh, and Tim will be in the mix. So. You can't remove the coaching hat and put on your media hat. No, it's, it's hard to deal. All right. And I, I am, I am here. Well, I mean, obviously I'm doing media stuff. This is media <laughs> stuff, I guess right now, but I'm, I'm here primarily as a coach. I got you. Corinne, what about you? Yes, I mean, I can't disagree with that. I think I've got a big question mark over Hayden. I, I like Hayden. I think he is so, so talented. Um, but we have yet to see him successfully do a race this long. I mean, Lavaredo is the closest thing we've gotten to that. And that, that was a, a wonderful and a, amazing performance. But that that provides, you know, like a, the first 100K looking really good. And then what's going to happen after that 100K mark on a course that requires a lot more than just running fitness. Right. So that's my big question mark with Hayden. I would love to see him be in that top three, top five group. Um, he's got the potential to do it. He's got, sure. he's got the potential. He's got all the potential to do it. Yeah. We just have not yet seen that. Um, I think another person who could really not to say mess up the race, but could add a little bit of spice. Um, same as his girlfriend actually is Min Chi, the Chinese runner who led, he put 12 minutes on the lead group of men in CCC last year in the first climb. And it was a 80 minute climb. He is so fast. He did not win the race. Tom Evans caught him at kilometer 92, but like he's going to factor in somehow. Yeah. You know, and I would not, and, and, and what will that do to our fast guys like Hayden? Like, do they, do they counter that? Do they let him go? And I think that'll be really interesting to see how that plays out. Just to um, pause there for a second, there's something going on in China mm -hmm. when it comes to endurance sports. And particularly last year at the CCC, so UTMB, so OCCs, they were very much a factor. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I don't know, I don't know what it is exactly. I couldn't put my finger on it, but um, it seems like there is a bit of an upswell when it comes to... Well, the fervor is high. It's in the China. it's the fastest. China has the largest, fastest growing trail running community in the world. Mm -hmm. um, followed closely, actually, by South America. Um, but it's so it's interesting. Um, having been over in Hong Kong to race this year, they'll be, you know, the top ten. You'll you don't know most of them. Mm -hmm. It's insane. And part of the issue, and what I've heard, is that it's actually really hard to get visas to get them into these big races, to get them get them to the U.S. to race, to get them to Europe to race. It's a, it's a visa issue. So there's a ton of talent brewing in China. We just haven't seen it on the international stage yet. We actually have a gal over here with the Adidas team who won Hong Kong 100K, who will be doing um, OCC. Lu is her name, and you know she. No one knows who she is because. She's never, like, she had 100K finish and no itra points going into Hong Kong 100K. Mm -hmm. And that's all she's got. Spanked everyone. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so China is interesting and it's going to continue to be a factor in this sport and we're yeah. seeing it now. And it's even outside of trail and ultra running. The number of endurance events that are or have popped up in China over the last few years from trail and ultra races to triathlon, uh, even marathons now in China, they're trying to add. Uh, another a seventh marathon major and it's going to be you know in china is it's like eye popping i mean it's just it's amazing how fast things are growing over there how competitive all of these different events and disciplines are and to corinne's point 99 percent of them you've never heard of yeah mm -hmm. and they're good and they're, and they're very really good. good and we're gonna we're gonna be continually blown away by their performances as they come in. And we saw that last year at CCC and we're going to see it this year, hopefully in a couple of races. And I think for them, it's just, it's learning for like for Min Chi and for Miao Yao, it's, it's learning um, to race this caliber of race because they, they don't often race these races because they, they can't get to them. And so I think there's just a learning curve and they're going to figure out that learning curve really quickly and it's going to be crazy. And I'm, I'm excited for that, but there are like, yeah. So 
I think he's going to factor in. I think Minchie's going to factor in. It's just going to be interesting to see how he factors in. I think he'll be an early aggressor. And again, much much like his girlfriend, I think for better or worse, he's going to affect people's races behind yeah. him. Yeah. He's going to pull see, in the Miller. But he's to be he's taken seriously. Oh, yeah, for sure. I see him as a win or dropout type person as well. And I, this is where I worry about our buddy, Zach Miller, is... And I talked to him about this yesterday. I am certain that Minchi is going to run that first five miles down to Les Zouches at like five minute pace. He'll hit it in like 30 minutes. And typically yeah. you guys are what, like 35, 37? Something like that. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, Zach, you know, he, he actually said to me, because I said, who do you think is going to go with you? Yeah, on Friday. And he said, well, that's if if I even, you know, take it out like that. I was like, yeah, right. Dude. <laughs> well, <laughs> Zach's a super interesting yeah. one because yeah. that is his racing style. Yeah. And he won CCC like that here mm -hmm. in 2015. He's run. I mean, every last, race he's ever run. Yeah. He's, he's, he's every TNF, one, ever TNF won. TNF he's won in that style. T yeah, TNF yeah. finished. That's his style. And, and mm -hmm. you know, last year it came back to bite him and he was one of those guys before the race last year. We were talking about this earlier. He took how many laps around the mountain yep. before the race. And Tim was telling yeah. a story that last year they went up, uh, you know, they went up like the week before they just went on a hike. He's like, he's like, Oh, I feel kind of tired. Mm -hmm. Um, and he went into that race tired and, and, and you so could, did Jim. Yeah. yeah. And, and you could see, and you could see it on both of them. I mean, Jim dropped, uh, earlier than Zach did and, mm -hmm. and Zach, you know, I, that was the most epic implosion I've ever seen yeah. in my in my entire life. But I think he'll learn from that. Um, Zach's a smart guy. And, and again, that came immediately after Champay. Yeah. So it's just like if you've miscalculated the slightest bit yeah. um, there after Champay going into the hardest part of the course, you are screwed. Yeah. But I think I think he'll make the adjustments that he needs to make so that doesn't happen again. I don't know how his health is right now i know he's dealt with a lot of injuries over the past year we haven't seen him racing quite as much he's done some shorter stuff but i mean you know zach miller has won a race here mm -hmm. uh he has been competitive in pretty much any race he's ever yeah he's ever towed the line for I, he'll be in it um, yeah i you know i see zach i mean he obviously could win the race and nobody puts out as much effort right. and has as much just just grit yeah so much nobody's grit. more fun to watch yeah oh he is the most like i would it's say my showman. racing style is very boring <laughs> and i would say that zach miller's racing style is very exciting and it, it makes it makes a great race yeah, it's great to watch and it's he's fearless you know he has dealt with some injuries and just running with him yesterday I was asking him how his foot was and he's like yeah like it's okay like it's not feeling perfect but it's not holding me back like i've been able to train and It'll for work. me i would have i would include him in you know the four who i think could win but i just feel like again as we said with courtney it's like if you're dealing with just the slightest little thing yeah. in this in this field it will expose yeah. you yeah. yeah it's just really difficult to win a race at this level if you're not like totally totally primed let me bring up another name that we haven't yet mentioned yet and that's one uh mr alex nichols the silent assassin I'm that's perfect you, i'm glad you brought that name the yeah. silent assassin yeah. he is sad he is dangerous is under the radar all the time but his pedigree i think it's not often talked about so what do we want to say about alex it's dangerous. He's very dangerous. <laughs> I think Alex is the most underrated runner in one of the most underrated runners in the world. And it's sort of been like that his entire career. Yeah. And he's one of the most accomplished European racers that America has ever produced. Back to when he was running the in his sky running days, he won the 90K of Mont Blanc here. And he's really solid, like across all different distances and you know a couple of years ago you may say that longer stuff would be his vulnerability but then he got second at western states and now he has the fkt on the nolan's 14 which is like a 48 hour thing so in the mountains right. like serious mountain running he hasn't done much this year he's sort of a fragile guy like a injury prone uh athlete but like when he's on he's totally a factor so i see him as somebody who could easily be on the podium here definitely and, of course and i again going back to just like the race week responsibilities like he's the type of guy who 
is not going to have to go like sign autographs for four <laughs> hours a day, yeah. you know? And I think there can be advantage sure. in that. There's a ton of advantage in Plus, being a dark horse. Yeah. You have no one wants <laughs> makes you do anything. It's great. And uh, last year, which I think was his first and only start at UTMB, he got clipped in the starting corral, yeah, right went down and yeah. had to drop out like at Santa Bay or yeah. somewhere really early. So I'm sure he's, he's motivated. I mean, there are a lot of guys in gals in this year's race whose days did not end well last year mm -hmm. and they're hungry I, and they're hungry and i think that's going to be some real fuel for the fire because no one wants to go home feeling like that again yeah yeah last year was a total anomaly it was weird and i like i did live commentary for a lot of utmb last year and it was it was chaos yeah. like i i got to watch in real time as like they try as Nuria and Hillary tried to com, like coax Zach, who could barely stand, out of Sean Paylock. and like that was the hardest thing to watch. But you like you watched it unravel, you know. You watched him attack, and you watched that attack falter, and then you watched him like unable to walk. Like it's it's a cautionary tale yeah. for sure. Yeah, I saw it in real time. It yeah. was crazy. It was, it was just nuts. so much craziness last year between Alex's fall, Magda's Tim, fall, Tim fell, Magda fell. A lot of helicopters were flown. A lot of helicopters yeah. were flown. The, the Team USA chant this year, I think, is no helicopter rides. Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, we'll see what happens. But the weather, I think, the weather is gonna is gonna favor some of that this year. Let me bring up one more American name again, not to make it too much about American runners, but. Um, Jason Schlarb, someone who's had a, a record of doing well at this race, I think his highest placement fourth. was fourth. Mm -hmm. um, can can he do anything this year to surprise solid, people? He's, he's had, had a, a solid year. eighteen months. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he, mind you, he has not entered maybe all the most competitive races. He's been doing a lot of the UTM um, race or UTMB races, I guess, elsewhere, Oman, these other countries. Um, but they're it's still time on his feet. It's still it's still race performances. Run Rabbit last year. Mm -hmm. I mean, he. He's got a pedigree, and I think he's got the grit and the the toughness factor, and he he'll run a smarter race. He's great in the mountains. He's a seasoned, he's a more seasoned ultra runner than some of our our young hungry guys, maybe. Yeah, he's forty plus. He's a, uh, he's, a master. he's a master, and he's still like totally ripped. I saw him with his shirt off the other day. <laughs> Jealous. He, he looks like he's about twenty five, but no, I agree. I really think Jason Schlarb is set up for a really good performance here as well with experience on the course. He had a rough one in 2017, but he still toughed it out for like a 70th place finish, which was, I'm sure, motivating for him coming into this year. And as Corinne said, just the last two years have been just like really, really consistent performances. And uh, having seen him the other day, you know, I, I think – for me, just like seeing what the athlete's mindset seems to be, like whether they're relaxed and uh, seemingly like at peace before the race, or if they're like scared and nervous about uh, putting themselves through what it takes. I think he, uh, Hayden and Tim, all of whom, you know, I've, I've spent a little time with over the last week, seem really, really set up. Uh, with that mindset game as well as with the physical fitness. We are biased because we are all American sitting around the <laughs> table talking about UTMB and it's like on the men's side, anyway, it's like, oh, this would be the year that an American wins. And I believe it certainly could be, but I believe it's also a year on both sides where Americans can do well in mass. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't have to be a one and done type of deal. I mean, all of those American men that we just named, get four in the top 10. I agree. Which I think as a, as a nation, we've brought the most talent. Um, you know, usually the French have, you know, they easily have the most number of participants in the field. But, uh, you know, outside of Xavier, you know, we don't have a Francois. We don't have a Ludo. But the French have won the last seven UTMBs on the men's side. It's a great and, stat, right? Yep. That's a great wow. stat. Um, Damn, Dylan bringing the, the knowledge, yeah. man, and the stats. I love it. He's made <laughs> for this stat. Deep, deep stats. And, and really, it's three runners. It's Francois, Xavier, and Ludovic Pomeray. Um, and they've won the last seven races here. So I think, I think this year... Talk if about it's home not, field advantage, man. Yeah, if it's not Xavier, you know, my... 
my heart and my instinct is that it goes to the most talented runner. Yeah. And I think we have two of them in, in Hayden and Tim. So I, I, I'm right there with you. I do think it is Xavier's race to lose ultimately being completely objective and un unbiased. But I do think that there's an element when it comes to, especially somebody like Tim, who's tired of being the bridesmaid <laughs> and he has all the knowledge to really put it together this year. As you mentioned, this is probably the, best conditions for an American man, uh, American male to finally take the top seating, but it's not going to be without some, a lot of pushback yeah. and uh, Xavier knows his course inside and out historically OCC, uh, CCC, you put any CCC attached to it or a TMB attached to it. And Xavier will be right there in the mix. They're going to be two big battles, both races. I mean, yeah. I think, there's going to be early aggressiveness in both just given how favorable the conditions are going to be uh as corinne got to commentate on last year's gonna be a lot of carnage in both races at the end but i think if you're prepared going in and you can stay upright and you can execute well um you know your your chances are, are pretty good if you can run your race and stay patient and you know not get caught up in the craziness that is utmb before we wrap up, give me give me a name or two on the dark horse, your d personal dark horse picks for UTMB on the men's side. Okay, can I go first? Is this for a top ten? Fine, go first. I, I feel I have a feeling that you might take mine. I'm just looking <laughs> no at your facial no expression and your mine, body language. So They're not exclusive. You yeah. can, you can okay, go but go ahead. I want to mention two people. One is last year's TDS champion Marcin from Poland. Right. Um, Super who, strong. Yeah, mm -hmm. very very strong. He was second at CCC. The year that Hayden won, he's the type of runner like Corinne who will be way back early, and I would expect to see him really move through the field in that last, you know, 50, 60 kilometers of the race. And I would not be surprised to see him top five or podium. And then I want to th just throw a little love to our boy, Damn it. Mr. Irishman. Damn it, he stole mine. <laughs> the thing is, like. Well, say his name. His first name's of all. Patty yeah, O'Leary. So yeah. Patty yeah. Seamus O'Leary or something like that. His name really Seamus. No, it's no. Not. <laughs> it should be though. <laughs> he does have a very. Irish I met name. his mom yesterday. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, my thoughts on Patty are that he loves to just hurt himself, like just loves to put himself through yeah. the misery, and I think that is so uh, valuable in hundred mile races in particular. But. I mean, it's just really difficult to train in the Bay Area and be prepared for this race. You know, I was somebody who tried to, to do that a little bit um, when I was living in California and then realized, you know, go out to Colorado and train for the summer. So he didn't have that um, possibility. But and I think, again, it's really difficult to have your best race. But certainly I think he he could, you know, on a good day get up there, top five, top 10 area. Just to piggyback off of that, I agree 100%. Uh, he raced here last year at CCC, mm -hmm. did all right. So he's got some experience on the course. He knows what he's in for. He's also, as far as pure running ability goes, one of the better men in the field. I mean, he ran a 220 marathon last fall at Off of like CIM, no training. Off of what was supposed to be like North Face 50 mile training and that event got canceled. So, you know, he ran that off of ultra training and he's not a super experienced marathoner. So that's pretty impressive to Dylan's point. He loves to hurt. He knows how to hurt. Uh, he's had some good efforts this year. I mean, he had, um, you know, the Wicklow round FKT yep. that has since been broken a couple times, um, but he was out for a long day. It's like 16 hours yeah, or in, something. Yeah. You know, in the Irish countryside mountains. Um, it wouldn't surprise me to see him get into the top 10. He's got a great coach in Matty Lay, so I know he's ready. And, yeah. he's prepared. and there, there is running on the course, as yeah. Corinne said earlier. Like, there's probably 40K of road. Oh, out, out at once you get up that climb out of Cormier, mm. so much running. Mm. But if you get to Cormier yeah. cooked, you're in trouble going going. No matter how yeah, you know, like, what your marathon PR is like, at that but point. But there is so much running. Like Especially over the top of Grand Colfere, you have like a half marathon descent. And then again you climb up to Champagne Lock and then it's you know, the moment of truth. Yeah, and then point. it's like three you know, it's just like three big climbs and descents from there to the finish. And and Patty I do know 
Um, we watched the storm roll in last night, and we are both praying for rain. And he <laughs> he want he wants to suffer. He he wants it to be epic out there. And going in with that mindset, I think, like could could be really good for him. Yeah. He's not he's not worried about like the performance aspect of it. I would say as much as he's just like he wants to go give it and wants to go suffer. And that that could really be like put like mean that he puts something together at the end of it. If the weather's bad, it's going to be a total, you know, unpredictable show out there. I think it's going to be, it, it, I think it'll not favor people like Hayden. I think it will favor people like Patty and Tim. Um, and yeah, if the weather doesn't cooperate, it makes it much more uh, mentally, psychologically difficult when you have to be managing your uh, you know, your jackets and your gloves and, and then fueling at the same time when you're cold and wet. Um, so that I think makes things much more difficult and interesting, but if the weather remains like this, I think it's going to be a, you know, 19 and a half hour day. No for the excuses men. type mm-hmm. of day. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that makes it hard and that it'll be really, really interesting. I have a, a different dark horse favorite to add to the mix, although I'm rooting for Patty but I'm biased. Lay it on us. Um, so a German, um, Janusz Kowalczyk, he I won Ultra name. Trail Cape Town last oh, yeah. year. Yeah. Kind of a total surprise to a lot of people. Um, he's coached by John Fitzgerald, so I know him through kind of the coaching the coaching world. Um, he attempted UTMF as his first 100 this year, but succumbed to, I think, stomach issues um, well after 120K. And he put together a really good first 100K before his stomach went south. So I think if he can, I don't know what his training's been like. Um, I do trust his coach. So I think that that's it. Like, you know, hopefully it's been good. But I do think that he could, he could potentially put together a really good day and he'll be a guy who no one, like no one sees coming. And he's the nicest, like just the nicest guy, which I think should give you bonus points <laughs> when it comes to ultra running. Mario, what about you? So on the men's side, my two dark horses were Alex Nichols and Patty O'Leary. She told me to prepare ahead of time yeah. and have my dark horses <laughs> ready. So those are my two. I don't have any to add to that. I don't know if we're talking about the women's field yet or going back to it. Do we give dark horses? For we kind of did. did. We, we kind of did, but uh, if okay. you had... Uh, I don't know that I, that I gave one. Well... I'm kind of contradicting myself because so I'll be biased now, but I coach Sally McRae. Uh, mm-hmm. She's returning to UTMB. She had dropped last year. Uh, she has not raced a lot this year for a number of reasons, but she's healthy. She's fit. She's back here. And I think she is ready to put together her best big mountain race. Awesome. Where, where that will land her, um, you know, it's anyone anyone's guess, but I think she's ready to, to throw down. Awesome. Can I'm I mention gonna... one more American name? Yeah, and, uh, it's interesting. Are that... you going to steal another name because oh, no. he, my dark horse is American too? Yeah, <laughs> Probably. Uh, Timothy Olson. Was okay. he yours? No. Okay. I think he has a very good chance of of uh, being in the top twenty, if not the top ten, sneaking in there. I do think that he has been steadily improving year after year. I know he's had a lot of past issues with. Uh, I can multitask, baby. Um, he's returning to form. He's slowly but surely returning to form, which is cool. It's so and, it's so good to see that. Yeah, and I do think that he has a he has a realistic chance of of podiuming, and by podiuming, I'm talking about top ten. So he's somebody I want to shout out to. It's good. Yeah, I mean, I love love Tim. We came up in the same generation. Always loved and admired him, but. Um, the other person I was going to mention is Mark Hammond. Mark Hammonds, yeah. Who's been a three-time top five finisher at Western States and uh, twice on the podium in that in those three years. So, um, you know, it's a different course, but he lives in Salt Lake. He can train in the mountains, and he's a solid 100-mile runner. So yeah. I don't expect him to win or potentially even podium here, but, I mean, he'll, I think he should be in the mix in the late stages for those top ten positions. We're a bunch of homers around this table. <laughs> We're deep, man. Yeah. We are deep. It's very deep. And it, I mean, we could all be proven wrong. I hope not. Yeah. But it that is a very Dylan strong being American like, contingent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, unless there's anything else to add, I think that about rounds up our UTMB coverage. Very lo- I mean, we look, come on. Yeah, we are fans of American running first and foremost, or at least follow it the most closely. But I do think that um, to underscore the point that this is a worldwide event where I do think historically American men, again, haven't placed 
well in the spe specifically in the t podium the traditional podium of one two and three so i do think this is the best odds of placing there but you know the narrative is whatever you want the narrative to be there's a ton out there obviously xavier coming back to repeat um you know on the women's side just one through 20 or 30 tremendously deep it's just so deep and, it, and like as we mentioned like if the weather does turn that we're not expecting it to Game everything changes. we've said means nothing yeah, yeah. like changes. we retract everything we've said because it is no longer <laughs> valid that was the all things being equal yeah pre-race prediction is it yeah. just me just on the weather for one more second is it just me or is it a touch more humid lately than it has been in years past it's, it's humid just, this morning it's just the rain i mean i like watching tds live doing commentary earlier i was like i i asked i was like oh has, has it been raining on them and it hadn't been raining on them it was just like so humid that they're all super sweaty and honestly like searching for water a little bit too because it's not warm but it's super humid out yeah Mario, anything else to add before we wrap up another but very special and unique episode of the Weekly Rundown? I got nothing else to add. I'd like to thank Corinne and Dylan for joining us. Thank on you this guys so much. This was amazing. You guys episode. brought some hot takes and then some. So we <laughs> very much appreciate it. And is there anything you guys want to plug? No. 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 Just drink your Red Bull. <laughs> Sneak up your Adidas and uh, zip up your North Face bags. Well, and if you're watch, I don't know when you're gonna post this, but if you're watching any of the coverage before Friday, well, I guess Dylan will be giving some coverage during the UTMB itself. Corinne will not because she's racing it, but they are they have been providing coverage and will continue to do so over the next Dude, day or so. We so got to throw out in. some love for the coverage because Best in the sport of endurance sports coverage, bar none anywhere in the world, better than most major marathons. It's phenomenal. It's insane yeah. in there. It's like. It's a hundred and five mile mountain race. It's the best scary. covered race. Well, in the there's world. some there's some live some of the feed from uh, Zach and Xavier's race last year. There was uh, Seb who was following them around yep. with a GoPro yep. on a like bike. A stabilizer. Yeah. Sebastian. No, he was Chen, running yeah. with them. Yeah. He ran 140 kilometers in two days last year. And this was all going out live. But yeah. when I was at Champe Lock, they had there's a dude on a bike with a camera ahead of them going out of there just yeah. filming him for as long as he could. Yeah, yeah. so it was really, really cool this year, and we saw it a little bit this morning in TDS. Is last year they didn't have a dedicated film crew for the women's race, but they do this year. Yeah, so last awesome. year, most of our Great. women's coverage, they'd see maybe the top woman, then they'd have to go back to the men's race, or they'd, go, they'd jump to an aid station. Mm -hmm. We saw most of our women's coverage last year in the aid stations, and this year we're getting drone footage and camera footage on the ground of both the men's race and the front of the women's race, which is <laughs> so exciting. I mean, as Dylan said earlier, at least compared to trail and running in, in the US, it is real deal professional sport here and the coverage of this race is on par with major professional sporting events that we see you know in the states and certainly for like other the types of sports here in oh, europe yeah. yeah it's it's incredible it really is incredible this is the best race in the world and i am so happy and psyched to be here even though i would love to be racing it's just there's nothing like utmb so for your listeners and you know viewers, viewers. i mean you gotta come at some yeah. point it's just the greatest event well I, and a lot of my listeners and viewers not all of them are fans of trail and ultra yeah. if you watch one race yeah. all year it's the first time i've looked at the camera all day make <laughs> it the utmb uh it will blow your mind and yeah. it is exciting racing you're like how exciting could it be watching people slog around a mountain for 20 to 30 hours it's pretty freaking exciting yeah and they're covering it in french spanish and english the media center is wild. It's and those guys like so I ran TDS last year and then I didn't sleep for four days because I did coverage Thursday, Friday, and then all all the way until Saturday evening when the top ten men and women came in. Like mm -hmm. it's it's awesome. Like come watch it in person next year. Run OCC, run MCC, like run something early and then hang out. Like it's this is bar none the best thing that like we've got going right now in trail and ultra running. Okay. See, we're not being homers. <laughs> we're giving love to a French race. Where, uh, where are you guys going to be on the course? So you're following. I'm going to be following Zach Miller, I believe. So I will be hopefully among the mix at the front of the pack. Mario, what about you? Uh, I will be out supporting Tim and Sally. I'm not crewing for either one of them, but I think I'm going to hop in Bounce a car around. with your coach, Jason Coop. And oh, good. He and I are going to hit probably four or five spots on the course. So. Yeah, it'll be a wild Friday night into Saturday morning. I actually yeah, had Coop afternoon. in mind for the show to um, to chop it up with him because he's a huge fan of the thing too. But he yeah. is 
out there supporting his TDS runners, and he's getting ready to do Tour de Jeans. Which, if you thought UTMB, sorry, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, digress too much, but if you thought UTMB was hard, Tour de Jeans makes this look like a like your neighborhood nuts. 5K. So uh, we won't unpack that right now. Dylan, Corinne, thank you guys so much for joining yeah, us you. on this an episode great. of the Weekly Rundown. Quick, quickly, where can people find the live coverage? I'm sure it will be spread out all over Twitter, but where can they actually watch the commentary and the and the video? I uh, probably should be better prepared for that. I'll be on and off on UTMB TV. I think if you just Google UTMB Live or UTMB TV, okay. it'll be pretty easy to find. Yeah, yeah, put you, you on the spot, yeah UTMB it's... TV is the online video coverage, and then UTMB Live is how you can track each of the races, like including PTL, which is going on right now, and that's also like extra crazy racing. So but I have an can... athlete doing PTL, and you can't go out there and crew them or help them out, but it's a 300K like back country trek yeah uh, that starts and finishes in chamonix um yeah. but that's about the only description of it that I you start you. seeing like random haggard people like kind of they're just shattered through. when they come in yeah i like mean zombies. they're gonna be absolutely shattered <laughs> but um it's it's utmb montblanc.com is the official website there'll be a link to yeah the live coverage at the top of the home page so just check that out but like we said it's awesome being here but if you can't that coverage is the next best thing. And yeah. truthfully, I'll probably be on my phone watching it at some yeah, of the... And it's a, while and it's you're a working, 20 to 30 hour race. Yeah, while so you're working tune on in Friday, different times. just put it up on your computer in the office and just like listen to that while you work on your dual screen, like your split screen. And It'll when you fine. go to bed, if you can go to bed and you wake up and shit, shit's going to change. Like it just, it does. So One last plug before we sign off officially of episode, is it 13? Of the weekly rundown? I think this is episode 13. Episode of 13 of the weekly rundown. A Patreon, uh, normally a Patreon exclusive show, but I think this will go out a little bit broader. Um, show Mario some love. Subscribe to his morning uh, shakeout newsletter, which drops every Tuesday mornings. Correct. And of course, the, the podcast of the same name, the Morning Shakeout Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to that. Billy Yang Podcast for myself and YouTube.com slash Billy Yang Films. And I think that's it. We are off to our other UTMB obligations, but this has been fun. You guys chopping it up. How long did we go? Uh, We went uh, about an hour plus, just a little over an hour. Typically, this is half an hour or so. Half an hour to 45 minutes. and I gapping about whatever happened the week before, but this is all UTMB. Yeah, consider joining our our respective Patreon pages for as little as a dollar a month. You get access to some exclusive content, including the weekly rundown podcast. Corinne's looking at the door, which we get it, Corinne. If you want to bail. I heard something. (laughs) All right, (laughs) wrap it up. We can wrap it up here. For for Mario Fraley, Corinne Malcolm, Dylan Bowman, and yours truly, Billy Yang, thank you for joining us for another episode of the Weekly Rundown. Ow!